Welcome back. Claims of corruption in politics here in the United States and everywhere the species politician operates grow louder and angrier every day. It gets to the point where it feels like corruption in politics must just be a fact of life. For the past couple of years, the most talked about piece of computer hardware on the planet has been a laptop owned by US President Joe Biden's son Hunter dropped off in a repair shop in Delaware in 2019 and never collected. It contains hundreds of thousands of emails and allegedly other content besides. My next guest is Israeli-American entrepreneur, writer and activist Yaron Brook, uh, chairman of the Ayn, at the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, he joins me now to consider whether political corruption is as endemic as COVID and if so, what might be done about it. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, does the Hunter Biden laptop contain evidence of corruption? Is I think so. I mean, it seems it seems like it does. Uh, I don't know that we've seen everything. There's probably even more than what we're assuming. But he's clearly sat on boards of companies in Ukraine that he had no business doing, uh, that, he that he added no value to. And uh, there's something going on in China with some money that he got. So, yes, I, I, I think there's certainly evidence of that. My, my, my gut reaction very early on yeah. um, was, why in Ukraine? Why was, why was Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, in, involved on the board of a company in Ukraine, of all places? What was going on with that? Well, look, I think they find the opportunities where they are. I don't think, I don't think it was uh, targeted in particular. Ukraine is an incredibly corrupt place, uh, so it's easy to smuggle somebody in who doesn't, uh, who doesn't really belong and who has, uh, has no value to add. But look, this is, this is not about the Bidens in particular. This is about American politics. This is everywhere in American politics. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot. You get these politicians going into office and they're almost always uh, quite, quite modest in terms of their income and wealth. And somehow they come out at the other side and they're fabulously wealthy. Uh, I remember an acquaintance of mine was a very senior guy in the Republican Party. Uh, he was, uh, I think, the leader of the, the Republicans in the House of Representatives. And then he lost. And guess the first job he got right after? Within a month, he got this job. It was a, it was a on Wall Street job, paying him well into six figures, over a million dollars a year. Why? Because he knows finance really well? Because he brings some particular skill? Yes, the skill of who he knows and the connections he has and how government works. This is how it works. And uh, politicians are becoming in America extremely wealthy. Look at the Obamas. Uh, look at the Clintons. They, they weren't wealthy when they started. Uh, Hillary gets $250,000 to give a speech. Is that because, before she ran for president, I'm not sure she gets it today, is that because she's a brilliant speaker and she has this amazing new knowledge to, to, to give us? No, it's, it's because people are buying influence. And we're undoubtedly seeing the rise of new dynasties, are we not? I mean, you know, how many Bushes, how many, how many Clintons, you know, how many Trumps, you know, you know it, it does feel as though there are new, there are new lineages emerging that we will be... There's no question. I mean, this is what happened when you have corruption and when there's a, this infinite pool, almost, of resources out there. And if that money is going to flow to, to people in power and they're going to share it with their kids and with their family, then we're going to be creating dynasties. Just today I read that Kushner, uh, Trump's uh, son-in-law, just started a private equity fund. Uh, he has raised two and a half billion dollars for a fund. He wants to raise seven billion. He's raised two and a half billion. Two billion dollars of the two and a half billion comes from the Saudis. The Saudis he was very buddy-buddy with throughout the Trump uh, administration. He helped them get a huge arms deal. Um, one wonders. One wonders why are they investing in me? He has no experience in private equity. He has no experience in what he's trying to do. But the Saudis are willing to risk $2 billion. Well, because they bought influence. There's no question about it. If that's what it's about, if, if, we're in, if, if the reality is that modern day politicians, particularly in the US, but I'm presuming elsewhere, if they are just identified by, by Wall Street and elsewhere as the, the prime source of influence and the prime source of contact, how do you break that chain? It's not easy, but the fact is that the more government is involved in our economy, the more government interferes in our affairs, the more incentive there is for me to try to get them off my back uh, and to do whatever I can to get them off my back. 
So the more we, we have government grow and regulate and control, the more cronyism we're going to get, the more corruption we're going to get. That's built into the system. When government is small, when government is limited, when government doesn't tell me how I should live, it doesn't tell businesses how they should run, then there's no incentive to spend millions or billions of dollars to, to try to influence them because they have no impact on me. So I think the best way to get rid of cronyism, the only way really to get rid of cronyism and corruption, is to bring government back to its initial, at least in America, what the founders intended it to be. And they intended to be, in a sense, an agency of defense. They intended it to be an agency that protects our rights. Instead, it's become the number one infringer of our rights uh, in the world. It, it, it never was intended to run a healthcare system. It never was intended to run a financial uh, system. It never was intended to regulate every single type of business out there. It was intended to keep us, to, to keep crooks and criminals and fraudsters and foreign invaders away from us, to protect us from that. And we have moved over the last 250 years, we've moved further and further and further away from that original vision. And as we move, every step we take, Every time the government does more, there's more corruption, there's more cronyism, there are more people who have to gain from having influence on the government. So we need to shrink. We need to shrink government power. Tom, sh should we fear big government? Should we, sh uh, where do you stand on that? Do we, is, is more Absolutely. government good or, or, or should we aim for the minimum of government? I don't quite buy into this sort of market fundamentalist ideology, you know, going back over 250 years to a constitution that was framed at a very different time um, in our history. Uh, but equally, you know, um, I don't agree with state paternalism. And, and I think that's really one of the great battles, whether you, wherever you are on the political spectrum that you have today. As I've said to you, I think before, Neil, I don't really see the great battle in the 21st century anymore between left and right. I see it as a battle between uh, broadly between libertarians and authoritarians. And I think where your politics sits will be usually somewhere between how you relate to either a more libertarian view of society or whether actually you buy into a kind of Chinese Communist Party view of the world, which is as long as material goodies are being delivered to you and your total standard of living increases uh, uh, from each generation to the next, you should just shut up, be quiet and be happy with what you've been yeah. given. Uh, big, where are you in that spectrum? Well, big Dr. government Dr. is usually bad government. Mm. It seems to me, and I'm married to an American, a Texan, you have to spend millions of dollars just to lose. <laughs> Shouldn't there be a cap on how much these candidates can actually spend, even at the Senate level? It's not an issue of how much they spend. It's an issue of how big the government is and how much there is to win or lose. But, but I agree. But money starts, you know, money, talking money. at that ground level, and then they start thinking, well, it's all about the money, the money, but, the but money. But the fact is, in many, in many campaigns, the, the, the candidates with less money are the ones who win. It, 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 money and politics yeah. are complex relationships, but the fact is that the more power we give politicians, the more incentive there is to influence them. So, and I agree about the spectrum. I think left and right are bankrupt concepts. Mm. I think we're basically individualism versus collectivism. And you have collectivism of the right, mm. and you have collectivism of the left, and our political parties today are collectivists of the right and left. And then you have individualism, which means freedom, which means free market. And what's sad is that nobody today on the political spectrum, nobody today with political visibility, ha is on the side of the individual, is on the mm. side of rights. And just one last thing, yeah. this idea of the right, the Constitution, the Constitution, I believe, is based, it's flawed. It was written 250 years ago, we could do mm. better today. But it's based on universally true principles. It's based on the idea of, of equality of rights. It's mm. based on the idea of uh, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which I think are universal and timeless. And if we could return to those principles, we moved way away from them, yeah. the world would be completely different and, and the glass would be fully full, not just half full. Yeah, you see, this is where you see I go back to 1642 and an ordinance in the House of Commons <laughs> that actually, during the you know the heat of the Civil War, which made the point that, that that the House of Commons is sovereign. So you know we don't have a codified written constitution because we have the notion of popular national sovereignty, and therefore the priorities of the people change over time. And and of course you're seeing this now with the Roe versus Wade debate in America, where something that you thought was settled in your uh, American constitutional and socially progressive uh, history, like the, the basic issue of women's reproductive rights, is itself now being reopened but and questioned again at a constitutional because level. Because America was born out of the Christian faith.
you know, the, mm. the Pilgrim Fathers that went from Plymouth to America. And I think that's got lost in the woods because mm. the churches have retreated and there's a gap between Parliament and the churches in this country as well as in America. Well, we're, 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 we're going yeah. to we're, we're disagree about yeah, that. There's, yeah. a, there's <laughs> a line that I, that I, that I, uh, that I see, that a quote from you, everyone has a moral right to pursue his own happiness. That's clearly redolent of the Constitution. Yeah. Free from coercive interference by others. Yes. Would you say that to some extent that's an upsum of your solution to how we get government uh, to back off and, mm. you know, put the money down? I mean, I believe that that is a summation of not just my view of, of the solution to, to the problems we face, political solution, uh, but I think that is the vision of the Enlightenment. That is the vision of uh, the thinkers, the, the British and Scottish and French thinkers coming out of the 18th century that really created the modern world. Uh, the idea was individual liberty and individual freedom, trusting the individual, allowing the individual to take responsibility for their own life, to go out there and live and, and prosper based on, on their own action, or to fail. Failure is part of it, but failure is just an impetus to get up and go try again. So I think that very much this idea of pursuit of happiness is at the core of what created America, and I think it's at the core of what made Britain, uh, the United Kingdom, what it is. It, 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 it launched an industrial revolution, it launched an intellectual revolution, and it made these two countries unique in human history. Uh, so yes, I think if we can return to the idea that the role of government is to protect our freedoms, to protect us from coercion, to allow us to go out there and live with a capital L, then I think we solve all of our problems. But it came from a religious base. The Enlightenment, the Enlightenment is exactly... But the Christian Enlightenment is the rejection of religion. The whole point of the Enlightenment, the, the 18th rejection. century, is the rejection is of the religion God. and the adoption of a secular basis for individual you rights. God out of and that's how we're doomed. But when we lived in a religious society, we were poor and miserable and life was horrible. No, the no. fact is that life has improved dramatically under a, secular, under a secular society. We're Christians. I think where we can probably find agreement, though, is that <laughs> whether, it, whether it be based in the Judeo-Christian tradition... Yeah, or whether that's it's what it came from. It, and it we've lost about, that. It, I, mm. it is about the sanctity of the individual. Mm. It, you know, and that, that was something that's enshrined yeah. in the, in the Judeo-Christian yes. thinking. But it's, yes. also, it's also in some, of the, in some of the Enlightenment thinking. And Tom, what, it, it, it is, if we, we have to cherish the individual, do we not? And, and, and enable the, the individual to pursue their dreams freely? Yeah, of course we do. But you know, we've also got to remember that uh, individualism, rampant individualism that isn't uh, checked by uh, fellow, fellow human beings, fellow citizens, that's not getting to the argument whether it should be government and collectivist measures, but that is the thing about human civilization. You know, we are not islands unto ourselves as individuals. If we were just nakedly pursuing our own individual self-interest on every single occasion, whether it's at the corporate level, oil companies going off and dumping things in our oceans or individual people exploiting people in their community no in order man to is generate an profit uh, from their misery, which is, you know, what we're seeing right in front of us across the channel with this, uh, uh, you know, abhorrent sort of business model. This is what happens, I think, when you don't have some kind of government that is there collectively. I mean, after all, but, government but, isn't separate from the people. Yeah, that's but, the point. No, but if that's a, a false, Democrat, a false view of individualism, same. because individualism is not the idea of living on an island. It's not the idea of separate society, because society is a massive, other people are a massive value to you. The idea that individualists go around raping and pillaging is absurd. Indeed, all the rapists and pillagers in the world and people who initiate war are always collectivists, mm. right? Individualists cherish their life too much mm. to actually go out and commit these uh, these horrific actions uh, that, are, that are being... We don't need government to protect us. We need government to protect us from really bad guys. Mm. But once you take out bad guys, even Adam Smith understood 250 years ago, it's pretty good. You know, the baker bakes the bread because he's trying to make a living. And he bakes the bread well. Why? Because that's what entails making a living and because he has pride in baking good bread. And that's also a self-interested action. Mm -hmm. So individualism doesn't lead to, to all these horrific outcomes. On the contrary, individualism is the solution to them. They, all the bad things that happen in the world today happen in the name of a collectivistic ideal. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think the solution is more freedom, not less, more individualism, not less. 
a shrinking of government that allows us to, to, to pursue our values based on our own minds. Mm. You know, we, we treat other people as if they're too stupid to take care of themselves. We treat the poor as if they don't know what they're doing and, and they need to get, we need to give them a check and we need to give them health care because we think they're subhuman. But if we treated them as human beings with dignity and respect, then we'd accept the fact that they can take responsibility for their own lives. What we need is to create the space for jobs to be created so that they can go and work. Work is where you get kind of yeah, and the it's dignity. Proverbs 16, verse 9. <laughs> Man makes his plans, God directs his steps. You leave God out of it, we're doomed. Man is not God. Well, wow. that's a fascinating debate. I'm so, I so enjoy. a lot of disagreement across this battle, I can tell you. Yeah, disagreement, yeah. but that's trade, isn't it? That's yeah. interaction, that's yeah. exchange. <laughs> exchange is what it's all about. Absolutely. Yaron, thank you so much. Thank that's you. That's a conversation I hope that we can continue in days and months and ahead. Absolutely, look thank forward to it. Thank you so much. Right.